Hi, so I'm really excited to talk today about our paper on extracting training data from large language models. Uh, I'm Nicholas, and this is joint work with a whole bunch of distant colleagues, and this paper really couldn't have happened without all of their help. So we now have machine learning models that are being trained on our medical images, that are being trained on our text messages, that are being trained on our emails. And with all of these, the idea is that somehow it's safe to train a model on a bunch of sensitive information and release that model as long as the information itself that it was trained on is never made public. And the question that we're interested in is, is this actually the case? Is it really safe to train a model on sensitive information and make that model public to be queried by anyone who wants to so that they can't learn particular information about individual training examples? This is very nicely captured by this XKCD uh, where we have someone typing at the computer, um, leaking information from the model by querying it with a very particular prompt. And really the question in this paper is like, is this comic reality? Does this really actually happen? And the lesson from our paper is that yes, uh, we are actually able to do exactly these kinds of attacks uh, by querying a model. So let me explain you how we do this first. And it's actually quite simple. What we're gonna do is we're gonna attack a language model. Uh, these are these models where you have some text as input and it's going to predict the output. So here we have some input text talking about unicorns in the Andes Mountains. And the output is talking about the unicorns, giving them names and going on about them. And so what we're gonna to do to extract training data from this model is we're gonna use the fact that models like this are designed to generate training or generate data. So we're just gonna make them spit out a lot of data. And then we're going to use what's called a membership inference attack to filter between the data that just happens to be output from the model and training data that it was memorized. Okay, so first step, generate lots of data. This is easy, right? You just go to the model and you say, give me lots of output and it gives you lots of output. Uh, we do this, we get a couple hundred kilobytes of output and then we have to figure out which ones are training data. And the answer is like these ones are. And the way we do this is what's called a membership inference attack. And they're quite straightforward. Um, all we do is essentially look at the different training documents that were the documents that, out, that were output by the model and observe that training documents have high likelihood by the model and non-training documents have low, lower likelihood. And so we sort of set a threshold and everything above that threshold we call training data and everything below it we call non-training data. And in practice in our paper, we have to do something else uh, that compares the likelihood of two different models because this straightforward thing doesn't work as well as we would like. Uh, but this is really the basic idea and I would encourage you to look at the details for, for more information for the paper. So, okay, what we're gonna do um, is extract training data by just um, generating lots of output and then predicting which of those things look like training data. Um, now let's talk about what the, we can actually, how, like, how well this works. And for this, we're going to attack a model that's called GPT-2. Um, and this is a model that was trained by OpenAI. It's the same one that generated the unicorn text I showed you earlier. And the reason why we're gonna attack this model is sort of threefold. Uh, first, the model when it was trained was the state-of-the-art model in, in natural language processing. Uh, lots of other researchers, including myself, have done work on privacy of language models and have looked at the privacy of their own models and like we as privacy researchers don't know how to train good models. Um, and it's entirely possible that we can do attacks on the models we train because only we just train them poorly. Uh, and maybe the good models that are trained by the best researchers in the world um, are somehow better, they generalize better and memorize less. By attacking state of the art model, we prevent all that from happening. Uh, we also attack this model because it is a public model. Anyone in the world can access this model, and so this mitigates the harm um, of somehow only us being able to do this kind of attack. And another thing that mitigates harm is that GPT-2 was trained only on data from the public internet. Um, so even if we like succeed beyond our wildest dreams and manage to extract all sorts of training data, the only thing we're gonna be able to do is extract data that was already public on the internet. And so this means we're not gonna be able to get anything ter terribly sensitive out of it, um, which sort of mitigates the harm that we could cause. Uh, but on the other hand, it turns out that the training data itself, like the 40 gigabyte training data set, was never released by OpenAI, 
And so we're not going to be able to accidentally cheat by overfitting against some test set in some way. Okay, so this is why we're going to attack GPT-2. Um, so let's let's do it. What do we do? Um, we extract training data. We take 600,000 potential documents that we could extract. Um, we And then we filter these down. Um, that we've, out, we've, we've generated 600,000 outputs. We filter these down to 1,800 by the membership inference attacks that might be memorized. And then we manually analyze each of these to find 604 actually memorized training examples. Uh, this is a significant underreporting because we are limited here by the amount of manual effort we can do to analyze training examples. Um, but among these 604, we do find a very wide and diverse set of outputs. Um, we get everything from news to Wikipedia entries to URLs to code um, to various pieces of religious text. Um, and all of this is fairly benign, but this is, again, by design. Uh, we don't want to get sensitive data. Um, you can imagine that if this model were instead trained on email records, uh, you should expect a similarly diverse kind of representation of memorized content. Uh, it would just be all of a sensitive variety. Um, now, I should say that we do it extract at least some sensitive content from this model, uh, where we are able to get a number of people's actual names with addresses, um, email addresses, phone numbers, social media handles uh, attached to their names. Uh, so even though it's trained on only public data, we do get some sensitive data out of the model. Um, now in our paper, we break this down into a bunch of different strategies for sampling and a bunch of different strategies for membership inference. I would encourage you to go take a look for details. What I'm going to do though for the rest of my time is explain one particular experiment that we do which is quite nice, I think. Uh, and what we do is we find a single training document that happened to repeat a bunch of URLs a different number of times between 8 and 359. And we can ask for all of these URLs, which ones are memorized by the model? And what we find is all of the URLs that are inserted in this training document 33 times or more are memorized by the model, and none of the ones that are inserted fewer than 33 times are memorized. And so there's this very nice sort of threshold of where memorization happens for these kinds of URLs. Okay, so this is one model. Uh, this is the 1.5 billion parameter model that everyone thinks of when you say GPT-2. Uh, but OpenAI trained not only this model, they also trained a 300 million parameter medium-sized model. And for that model, we can ask the same question, how much memorization is there? And there's a lot less. Uh, only examples that are inserted 56 times, and only then some of the time, are they memorized. And they also trained a small model at 100 million parameters, which only barely memorizes the first sequence, which was inserted 359 times. And so there's this very clear trend, where as models get bigger, they memorize significantly more information, even though the smallest model here is 100 million parameters. I and mean, that's like 400 megabytes on disk, this model still memorizes significantly less than the 1.5 billion parameter model. And the reason this should be concerning is models are getting really, really big. The GPT-2 model that we're attacking is this model here. We've already gotten a thousand times bigger than that model. And so if you were to ask me how much memorization is happening in, the going, like in these biggest models today, I would say you, know, you need to insert something only a handful of times given the trend we're seeing here. So this sort of begs the question, um, what do we do for defenses? And for this, you know, if you had asked me a couple of years ago, I'm, I might say differential privacy is going to save everything. In fact, I did. Um, and unfortunately today, I think this might be the case, but it's not quite the case yet. And really the reason why is that we can't deploy differential privacy in the naive way we would like to. Uh, first, because it's very hard to define what a training record is. Um, any one person can contribute to any number of different documents and isolating out what their contributions are is very hard. And also DPSGD makes models slower to train and loses accuracy in the training process. And the whole reason we use these big models in the first place is because they give really good accuracy. And so asking people to give up accuracy uh, is essentially asking them to just not use the big models. So in order for DPSGD to work, it needs to be able to scale to these large models. Okay, so um, there are other defenses that people have been proposing. Basically, none of them work. And so for now, I mean, using DPSGD is the only thing we can do. It just is not quite scalable to the points that we would like, and we have these issues with records. So to briefly conclude then, um, language models do memorize their training data, and this is a real problem. 
Uh, it's not just an academic problem. Actually, yesterday, as I'm as of the recording of this talk, um, OpenAI just just sort of announced this code completion model in partnership with GitHub, uh, where um, turns out if you ask it to write you a fast inverse square root, it will memorize verbatim the GPL copyright uh, implementation from Quake. And this is a big problem. And so like we're really starting to see big models that are out there in the world today that actually have this kind of memorization problem right now. So basically the conclusion here is that we really need to understand how memorization works in neural networks, what's going on that makes this actually happen so that we can then go and prevent it because the machine learning community is going to keep training bigger and bigger models and they're going to get deployed. Like we are already seeing this now, it's only going to get worse in the future. And so as a security community, we need to figure out ways of analyzing how this happens and finding ways to prevent it from happening so that we can stop this from, you know, becoming a real serious threat over the next couple of years. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions.